Good morning. Today we begin the Gospel of John. So let me encourage you to take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 1. We'll be going through the Gospel of John for the next couple of weeks. At least. Thank you. John chapter 1, verse 1. It tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him. And apart from him, not one thing was created that had has been created. Now, this gospel has a purpose. It's going to answer the questions people have about who Jesus is. Now, you have to, you have to approach understanding Jesus with the desire to know him. I know there have been those who have approached this gospel trying to disprove Jesus. Eh, I'm going to tell you, that's not going to work. But if you want to know him, I do not find a better writing in Scripture than what we have here in the Gospel of John. Because by nature, even spiritually, we're curious people. It begins with childhood, with children asking the question, why? I know as parents, sometimes you feel like you answer a lot of why questions throughout the day. If you're a mom, a survey was done and says that you probably answer 300 questions from your children every day. They did it by age and they said girls at the age of four ask 390 questions a day. Wow. Well, they want to know. A daughter said, Mom, why is your tummy big? She said, well, I'm expecting a baby. She said, where's the baby? Uh, in my tummy. You ate the baby? <laughs> they they want to know. A four-year-old said, hey, Dad, when are you going to die? Well, I don't know. He said, hopefully not for a long time. Oh, well... When you and mom die, I need to let you know I want new parents. He said, you what? He said, yeah, I'm not, I love you guys, but I'm just not old enough to work the stove yet. In the middle of dinner with no context, child asked, mom, what did it feel like on your last day of being a child? That's a great question. Another one was, since your eyes are blue, does that mean you see everything blue? And then they asked Dan one day in the olden days, was everything in black and white? <laughs> and here's a great one. How do I know that I'm real and not just a dream of someone else? Wow. That's pretty crazy. You see, children hunt for knowledge. They examine their surroundings and they want to know. As they grow older, their surroundings grow larger and more complicated. And they continue to retain that curiosity. They just want to know. Mankind devised theories to explain the phenomena they observed. They devised myths and philosophies or scientific statements to explain the natural world. Some have observed the sky by eyesight. Others build telescopes. And still others send space probes to investigate what telescopes are unable to reveal. Always exploring, investigating, questioning, and trying to understand. She never grows old asking why. The same with the spiritual life. People want to know God. If there really is a God, 
People want to know. And apart from God's self, apart from his self uh, revelation, our minds are, are baffled. We can't really come to know him clearly. So we devise theories and philosophies. Job's book says this in 11.7. Can you fathom the depths of God or discover the limits of the Almighty? Absolutely not. If left to ourselves, this is impossible. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 says, Now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit. Since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God, for who knows a person's thought except his spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. Man will forever remain in ignorance unless God steps in to disclose himself to man. Now, what I want you to understand is this. God has done that for us through Jesus Christ. And John is going to teach us who Jesus Christ is. This is his whole purpose. If you were to write a paper, this is how you would write a paper as John has written his gospel. You would throw forth right away what you intend to do. And that is to demonstrate that Jesus Christ is God. And then he goes through his entire thesis and he explains this very clearly so that you might know that he is the son of God. And he ends his gospel there in chapter, in the, in the, uh, chapter 20, in verse 31, even though there's one more chapter. He says this, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so this gospel is going to set out to explain to the person who wants to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and God Almighty himself, and he reveals everything that you need to know about God to have eternal life. That's exciting to me. And so we're going to go through this book, and I hope it's going to be encouragement with you, to you as you grow in the Lord and as you share him with others. Let us, let us pray. Father, what a privilege to gather in this place this morning with brothers and sisters and to honor you and to worship you and to seek you. Lord, we want to acknowledge your greatness, that everything your word says about you is, is true and revealing and offers us the great eternal privilege of knowing you. Thank you for the many ways you've revealed yourself to us. Thank you for the many ways you've been faithful to us. And even when we can't see, we are, have that confidence. You're still at work. And you're working your purpose right in the midst of what we're going through to accomplish what only you can do. That out of ashes, you, you restore. Out of weakness, you provide strength. When we're blinded, you provide direction. When we're hurting, you provide hope. Thank you that no matter what we're experiencing at this moment, you're at work shaping and molding us into who you want us to be. You're revealing yourself to us in ways we may not have experienced you before. And we get to know you. Now, Lord, I ask that you would speak to us this morning. Remind us again of this, the great truths of who Jesus is and the privilege we have to know him and to worship him. In his name, I pray and give thanks. Amen.
Please be seated. I love the way John starts his gospel. He uses a very particular word that means so much. And in our English translation, it's actually word. And in the Greek, it's the logos, the word. And he refers to him being the word. And why is that important? Well, we got to know some things about Jesus. He just didn't come on the scene. He's always been. So number one, I want you to see that he is the pre-existent person. He's the pre-existent person. He's not some sort of force. He's not some sort of power. He's much more than that. He's personal. Prior to creation and eventually his birth, Jesus existed. Not as Jesus, but as the Word of God, the second person of the Trinity. So number one, he's the invisible Word of God. In the beginning was the Word. Who was there? Before anything was created, before anything was put into place, he was there, but who was there to see that? No one. If God didn't tell us, we wouldn't know. And so he reveals that to us, that before anything was created, there was God. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's probably one of the most important words that John could have used as he opens his gospel, and that is the logos. In, for a Jew, what did that mean? When, when John begins the Word, and he uses the Word, the Word has some very important significance to a Jew. In Genesis 1.1, their mind would go back to the Word and they would no doubt experience the Word of God and they would go back to their own Word and, and the Bible begins with this truth that in the beginning, there was God. And so for the Jewish mind, the Word was very important because it took them back to the beginning of the Word where only God was. And it was God who created the heavens and the earth. So for the Jew, the word of God is powerful because it always speaks about an event or something happening. And so when they heard this from John in his gospel, they knew that God was doing something. There was an event happening. He's going to disclose himself. The unseeable is more than just a powerful effect. Too often we only see the effect and we don't understand the cause. For instance, if you watch the leaf go down the middle of the road as it was blowing along, you would think, well, that leaf has some ability to power itself down the road. But to know the truth, you have to go and understand the fact that the wind blew the leaf. And so John is trying to tell us that in the beginning, there was a powerful force that was putting into place all of creation. It wasn't creation just doing it on its own. It happened as a result of a person, a powerful person who created all things, who was once hidden and is now through his creation being revealed. Now, one thing about John, he didn't write just to Jews. Also, the Greeks were capable of hearing this message as he spoke about the Logos. So to the Greek, this was a very significant teaching. Heraclitus, who in the 6th century BC lived, he made this statement. He said this, it is impossible to step in the same river twice. Things are always changing. And he came to the conclusion that what change we see is not random, but it's or by chance, but it's ordered. His conclusion was there must be something divine. There must be some divine order causing these changes to happen. There was a controlling principle of matter. And that controlling principle was God's logos, or his word. Now that was just a small step now to apply the logos to all of events in history. 
and the mental order that rules the mind of man. So he's basically saying is this, that everything that happens, it's not by chance, but there's an actual order, there's an actual intelligence behind it, and it's the word of God. It guides events and it also guides the minds of men. Now this is a Greek philosopher in the 6th century BC that is teaching these things. And so John now has to tell, has the opportunity to tell these Greek minds, this one force that your teachers taught about is now being revealed and has been revealed through Jesus. Because the Logos was the word that was with God and was God. And in verse 14 of this gospel, John goes on and says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us so that we would know him. So this powerful force that was controlling events that you understand was God's word and the minds of men has now come in the flesh and God has revealed himself to us. I think this is exciting how John begins his gospel. I think it's powerful for those who wanted to know if you want to know God, I am confident of this. If you are seeking him, if you are knocking, if you are asking, you turn to God's word and especially the gospel of John and I am confident of this. God is going to show himself to you. But you have to be serious about it. You can't sit somewhere and, and seek You can't stand there with your hands in your pocket and knock. And you can't ask unless you humble yourself and want to know. Number two. It's the incarnate word eventually becomes the incarnate word. What I mean by incarnate, he becomes personal, becomes real. Notice in verse 2, what does he use as a personal pronoun? So he's not some power, but he's a person. He said, he was with God in the beginning. And verse 14 tells us, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And John says, we beheld his glory. The glory is the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. To the, to the Jew, he was revealed. The word was revealed. In Genesis 1-3 says, and God said, let there be light. And to the Jew, you could actually see what God says. If God says he's going to do something, you could actually see it. And so the Jews, when they hear him say the Logos, and he becomes flesh and dwelt among us, the word of God is now being revealed, and it actually can be seen. So when God is about to do something in this gospel, and that is to reveal his son, you can see him. And you're saying to yourself, well, how can I see him? I wasn't there. Well, God will open your eyes to see him in a way that you couldn't see him in a physical way as you look for him. You see, they understood the power of his willingness when he speaks to reveal himself and to show something. Isaiah 55, 11, he says, so my word that comes from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish, it will do something, it'll do what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. And in Hebrews, the writer tells us this in chapter one, verse one, long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. And these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. So God's word, when he speaks, he wants to show himself to us. So that what happens? We get to know him. And John's going to tell us the importance of knowing him because that is eternal life. Now, to the Greek, we have to jump a few years to Plato. Plato said this to some of his students as he gathered around them at Mar Hills, I've been told. It may be the someday, he said, 
there will come forth from God a word, logos, and will reveal all mysteries and make everything plain. And John says, this one that even Plato spoke about has now come. So you can see how he's capturing the mind and the spirit of the Jews as well as the Greeks. He's beginning to show them who this Jesus is. He is God himself who has come to reveal God to mankind so that we might know him. You want to know him? I am confident of this. He has done a wonderful and magnificent job in revealing himself to us so that we may know him perfectly. He is, as John tells us, the pre-existent person of God. Number two, he's the powerful producer. And I know some may say this, well, I've never seen Jesus. But you have seen what he's done. You have seen what his power has accomplished. I know oftentimes we have the privilege, just as we had in the last couple of days, is to be here uh, in, in this room and to be trained for the Billy Graham uh, evangelism event with uh, Franklin Graham. And you have an opportunity to, to, to learn a gospel presentation and then share that presentation. But I'll tell you, there is no greater presentation that you can share than what Jesus Christ did in changing your life. I, I, I'm, I'm not what I'm supposed to be yet, but I'll tell you this, I'm not what I used to be. A change has happened in my life, and it was significant, and it was huge. And I'm telling you, your testimony of the changing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to have more of an impact on people than anything else. God's going to use that in powerful ways. God also uses his creation to reveal himself. So his power, as a powerful producer, we can see his power, number one, at God's creation. His creative revelation. He says, all things were what? Created through him. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. So the word created everything. The word of God created everything. In Genesis chapter one, verse three, it says, then God said, let there be light. And what happened when God's word said and God's word went out and God's word accomplished what God sent it out to do? What happened? When God said, let there be light, there was light. Now it goes on in verse six. Then God said, let the expansion between the waters separate from the water from the water. Guess what happened? There was a separation. In verse 9 it says, then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it says, and it was so. Then God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and fruit trees and the earth bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so, and it goes on to verse 14, it says the same thing. It goes on through all of creation. When God said it, it happened. That's powerful. This is the powerful word of God. This is not just some force out there. This is the power of God that created all things that is willing to live within us. That same power that created all things. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The same power that God used to change this world, to turn the world upside down in the book of Acts, lives within us. That's exciting to me. And Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says, For his invisible attributes. That is, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he made. As a result, people are without excuse. Just looking at nature itself, you can see the magnificent power of God. You have two options. You either can accept the fact that that somebody and God's Logos created it, or you can reject it and say some other powerful thing happened that created all things. You know what people use today? They use the most powerful thing 
in the world today is matter itself. And in order to get matter started, there had to be a big bang. But the Bible says God created matter. So basically an argument is like this. If you were to go to a junkyard and blow that junkyard up, you would end up with a Hummer. That's basically what it's saying. Or if you go to the grocery store and go down the cereal aisle and blow up all the boxes of alphabet soup, you would have a book. That's the argument. For me, my presupposition is not that matter has always existed, but the word of God always existed. And he is the one who is all powerful. And you want to know the power of God? Stand on his word. Number two, I want you to see at the Lord's resurrection, just because we talked a little bit about that last Sunday. I want you to see the power in his resurrection. His creation is amazing. It's a revelation of who he is, but man, the power in his resurrection. And I'm explaining it this way. In, Luke, in John chapter two, we're gonna see a little later on, they were getting excited about the temple. And Jesus said to the disciples, he said, if you destroy this temple, I'll raise it up in three days. And they all kind of were startled. What do you mean? It took, it took 40, 46 years to build this. And you'll raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. That's awesome. That is so awesome to me. I'm thinking, he says that I'm going to be crucified at the hands of the scribes and the Pharisees and the political leaders. I am going to die, I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to be raised from the dead. And guess who's going to do it? I am. I don't know about you, but that's power. I don't even know what I'm going to be eating this afternoon. I don't even know if I'm going to be around tomorrow. And he raised himself from the dead. In Acts chapter 17, Paul's in the middle of the Areopagus, and there are all the philosophers of the Greeks are standing. And, and learning and, and teaching. And, and he noticed as he walks through, there's an, a, an altar that's to an unknown God. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, in it, he's the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in shrines made by hands, neither does he serve by human hands, as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives everyone life and breath to all things. You know, you can almost picture them thinking, is, it, is he talking about this Lagos thing? that we were so focused on? He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we leave, live and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, then we should think we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the time of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has sent a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed and has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. I think that's a powerful statement. He's provided this proof to whom? Everyone. Number three, he is preeminently personal. That means before everything else, God wants to be personal. And what I mean by that is this. He, again, wants you and me to know him. He's preeminently 
before all else, he's wanting you to know that you can know him. And the thing he does, he, number one, shows the Father. In Exodus 33, it was there that Moses wanted to see God's glory. He says, you can't see my face, Moses, for humans cannot see me and live. The Lord said, here's a place near me. You are to stand on the rock, and when my glory passes by, I'll put you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you will get to see my back. But my face will not be seen. And Jesus says this about himself. In John chapter 5, verse 37, the Father who sent me has given himself, uh, who sent me has himself testified about me. You have not heard his voice at any time, and you haven't seen his form. And in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 11, Jesus talking about his departure, and he says to them this, let not your heart be troubled. Sean Hannity says that too, but he got that from God. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If not, I would have told you, I'm going to away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. <laughs> That's crazy to me. You want to know the Father? Jesus said, look at me. And then the Lord, uh, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. And that's enough for us. And Jesus saying, what do you think I just said to you? And Jesus said to him, have I been among you all this time and you don't know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who lives in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is me in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. You want to know God? Know me. Look at me. You want to know God? Turn to the things of God. And when you do, I am confident of this, you will get to know God. He has shown us the Father. You will see him. He wants you to see him. He wants you to know him. And number two, he will speak the final word. He speaks the final word. Not only was he the word at the beginning, but he's also the word at the end. In Revelation 22, 12, look, Jesus said, I'm coming soon. And my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. Now at the end, there's only gonna be two possible, two possible things spoken to you at the end and to me. Number one, Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He, he was the first word, and guess what? He's gonna have the final word. And if you and I don't attach ourselves and get to know the word now, it's gonna be a, a tough one at the end. But it'll be no problem at all if you know the word today. It's going to be glorious. I can't wait to hear those words from the Lord. Not because of what I've done, but because of what he's done through me. Well done, good and faithful servant. Not because of anything that I accomplished. It's only because I yield myself to him and he did it. Anything that lasts forever is because of what the, the vine did in the branch. Not what the branch did. Or else you'll hear these words. These are the last words Jesus will speak. The last words, the logos, that you will hear. Then he announced to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, 
you lawbreakers. Those are the only two options at the end. Whether you believe in God or not, it really doesn't matter. He's still going to have the final word. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. He is Lord. I am so confident God is still speaking today so that we get to know him. He's speaking to you right now. Now the important thing is to respond to what he's saying. Say, Lord, I yield myself to you. You do your work in me. Change me. Make me yours. I give my life to you and I trust you. I trust you to accomplish what only you can for your glory and for your purpose. Father, we give this invitation to you. I thank you that you continue to speak today so that one day we might hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, Lord, speak to us. Accomplish what only you can in a real and powerful way. Change us this morning. Transform us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I invite you to stand. There's a great opportunity to publicly, publicly share what Jesus has done in your life. You know, a lot of times we talk about publicly coming and, you know, Billy Graham's and Franklin Graham's event that's coming on and people come forward. Um, and people say, well, I don't have to come forward. I can just stay right where I'm at and make my decision. Yeah, you can make your decision right where you're standing. But Jesus didn't make his decision in heaven. He came forward. He publicly died for you and me. And he says, if anyone's a, a, ashamed of me, I, I will be ashamed of them. But anyone who announces me before man, I will announce him before my Father in heaven. I, I'm finding this out, that if I don't have Jesus standing by me announcing me to the Father, I'm in big trouble. I'm in big trouble. So it's important for you and me to publicly, at times, publicly, let others know what Jesus has done in their lives. So this is an opportunity to publicly, publicly, Stand for Jesus. What has he been saying to you this morning? You come as we sing.